This is Grow Your Ayurvedic Business, Week 7, Enrollment. I'm Jacob Griscom, and this is an Everyday Ayurveda production. So as always, let's start by preparing our space and having our opening meditation to come into the now, to abide in the self, swasta, our definition of health. So first, turn off any distractions, of course, the big ones, the cell phone, text message, email, the instant messaging. Create a quiet and focused space for yourself. In fact, one of the portals to spirit, of course, is silence, as well as space. All sound comes from that silence. All objects arise in that space. And if you put your awareness, your attention, on silence that underlies all sound and on the space that underlies all objects, you actually create to actually connect with that space in yourself, which is, in essence, your true nature. So focusing on the underlying field of silence, the underlying field of space. Relax your body. Bring your attention to the flow of the breath. So your identity moves away from the constant stream of thoughts images, concepts in the mind, and rest anchored in the field of the body, the gateway to pure beingness, unmanifested true nature. You can follow the flow of the breath, and on the exhalation, as you listen to the, the sound, hum, and then rest in deep stillness. Go ever more deeply into yourself, into a space of no thought, no mind, pure being. And as you chant the Gayatri Mantra, chant the words, but remain centered in your essence and pure awareness. Don't actually form mental symbols or words around the words. Experience them without that filter. Essentially listen to them from the field of the body rather than through the filter of the mind. Oh. Namaste. 
Tonight we're going to be talking about the subject of enrollment. So why is this so important? What are you going to get out of this subject, out of this skill, out of this ability? Three main things here. The first is that enrollment builds the prospective client's understanding, the value of investing and in work with you for a committed period of time. This happens both on the desire or fulfillment side, you could say, the, the things that are going to happen for them and in them, as well as the cost side of not moving forward. Right? It'll be become clear where their current patterns have gotten them, any place where there's been unconsciousness, disharmonious actions, it will help to illuminate those results as well and show how, you know, potentially how long those have been an influence as well as moving forward into the future, how those continue to be a potential influence for them. So this enrollment process is one of awakening uh, from bringing anything that's in shadow in sort of darkness that's not being looked at into the light of awareness. And ultimately, again, that process is essential to be able to transcend any of these pieces, but uh, we can't move again from Thomas just right to Sattva. We can't transcend things we can't see. The second thing is that enrollment turns prospective clients into committed paying clients so that you can have the reliable income to do this work for a living. It's a pretty important benefit. Right? If you can do enrollment, then you can have even a relatively small number of clients that pay you well and are committed to doing work with you so that your mind isn't on the survival or keeping you know, your life afloat, being able to have the, the money that you need but you can actually be doing this work for a living, which is what we're here to do. So that's another very big, important benefit. And then third is that this enrollment process actually builds depth to your relationship from the beginning. It sets a tone for your work together. It's sort of the experience of you know, first impression. If the first impression that a prospective client has is one of space, of presence, of uncovering, they will be entering into the relationship basically through that doorway. It's hard to recover sometimes. It's always possible. But it's hard to recover from a challenging uh, first interaction. It's hard to kind of switch course. It's definitely doable. But you're really kind of setting the train in motion right here, getting the ball moving. And so why not do that from the beginning with one uh, with the space of depth, again, to set the tone. So the three great benefits that you're going to get out of this, this process, this consciousness, is this way to entering in and really going through the agony, the transformation of um, walking through that door of somebody being a prospect to them being a client. So our agenda tonight, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the what, a little bit about the how, and some about the empowering money and value beliefs, and then of course have um, some really clear homework to implement, to practice moving forward so that you integrate and implement, again, what you learn and actually get to get these results. So tonight we're going to talk a bit about sales and ethics. That word itself, sales, may carry um, some charge with it for you, as, uh, as it has for me in the past, as I find that it does for many. And we want to kind of reframe that process, what sales really is about, what ethics in sales is about. We want to talk about the three levels of healthcare, um, give a context for, you know, again, what the, the, the depth of the work that you're stepping into with a client, just to remind us all 
about the, the capacity uh, that we have as Ayurvedic practitioners, the level of work we can do with people. Uh, talk about an effective structure for your program. And again, this is different than the integral Ayurveda platform and how you build your, you know, basically the model for your program, build your program. This is simply the structure, how often you, you meet with somebody, for what period of time, those things. And then the second area is we want to talk about the process itself, this sales sadhana process. Remember, sadhana is a spiritual practice. So how about that for a reframe? Right, the spiritual practice of sales. How to prepare for it, how to do it, step by step. We're going to talk about why prospective clients don't move forward. We're also going to talk about how to support them. If it is, if the timing is right, if it does feel like a fit, uh, how to help them overcome the initial hurdles with making that investment and getting started. And then uh, we'll talk a little bit about empowering money and value beliefs. And these are very important. This is, again, part of mastering uh, your inner experience as a practitioner, making sure that there are no inner obstacles that are hiding out that would get in the way of clients being able to commit and pay you well. So let's start with the sales and the ethics. Again, we all have uh, a feel of some of the, the, uh, the bad taste or some of the charge that may exist around sales because a lot of unprofessional sales tactics have made a bad name for all sales. Some of these unprofessional sales tactics have to do with an emphasize on, emphasis on overcoming objections, with closing right, with basically uh, repetitive sort of non-listening but um, power over methods, essentially making somebody uncomfortable enough that they just buy to get it over with. So certainly, I mean, that those tactics can make sales feel like an assault um, and feel horrible and really turn you off. And in, if you've ever had some sales training in the past, they probably included um, and even emphasized a lot of those techniques and strategies. The important thing that's been discovered about sales, though, is that those tactics actually correlate with a lower success rate, especially in what are termed major account sales. So they have some minor degree of effectiveness in small one-time purchases. But anything that's relational, relationship-based, these things actually hurt sales, and understandably so. So instead, professional sales is the ethical art of uncovering benefits and costs to help people. So whether we are selling uh, technical solutions to a corporation, coaching of any sort, uh, whether we're selling a, an educational program, anything that's essentially going to be a long-term relationship or a major sale, the sales process of major account salespeople that are successful is a lot about uncovering benefits and costs. Again, just illuminating the full picture with curiosity and with interest that the picture becomes clear and that the motivation, if, if again, if it is the right product, if it is the right solution, then the motivation comes from the buyer rather than the salesperson pushing from the outside. And there's a book that I recommend that you get to read and, and just get a good orientation to this professional sales model. It's called Spin Selling. Spin Selling was written by Neil Rackham in the mid-80s, probably came out in 1985. And the reason it was so important was it was the first uh, major study of sales and sales techniques and sales effectiveness that was able to essentially show, show how ineffective and actually damaging a lot of the current sales training models were 
and really study what successful salespeople did. So it dispelled a lot of myths and brought in a lot of wisdom. And the core piece that I'll share with you is that sales success was correlated with the SPIN question. So hence the, the SPIN selling, it's an acronym for four types of questions that successful major account salespeople ask. They ask questions about the situation, about the problem, about the implication and the need payoff. You'll notice that implication and need payoff are in bold because they don't spend a lot of time with the situation and the problem. They want to get you know, orientation. We want to get a basic grounding of the situation and the problem. But major account sales is directly correlated with the number and quality of implication and need payoff questions. Implication questions basically ask about how the problem affects the individual or the organization. It illuminates that picture. So if we were selling, say, a computer upgrade to a corporation, we would ask them questions about their current problems with their computer system. So we'd say, okay, well, it's, it's slow. I hear that. How does that slowness affect your organization? Well, it reduces productivity. Are there any other ways that it affects your organization? Well, with reduced productivity, people get um, frustrated and irritated. It's a source of stress. Really, how does that stress, how does that irritation play out and affect things? Well, I, there are more arguments. It comes up as a constant um, topic in our weekly meetings instead of us getting to other important issues. What are some of those other important issues that it gets in the way of you being able to spend time on? What gets in the way of us um, talking about how we can improve our sales process, serve our customers better? You get the idea, right? So we keep on finding out what are the implications, what's this, the cascade of effects that are, uh, are generated. We illuminate the full picture, the whole sort of ecosystem that this um, issue affects. So again, we think about an ecosystem. If you change one thing in the ecosystem, it's not an island into itself. Right? We know this about how sensitive ecosystems are. If you eliminate like a single insect that's part of a, uh, a, a food network, then any other uh, animals on that food chain that are connected to that insect, you know, that eat that insect or that eat animals that eat that insect are affected by that change. If you want to kind of think of it, you're trying to get the complete full sister um, a view of all the implications that this problem has. Then the need payoff is on the on basically the pro side. What would they like to have different? So again, in this case, if they had this, whatever I'm making this general idea of this computer upgrade that happened that made things faster for them, what would that do for them? How would that show up? Well, if it was faster, now people would have more productivity. If they had more productivity, they could do this much more activity in this period of time. If they could do that, what would that mean? That would mean that they could potentially have you know, this many more sales. If they had this many more sales, what would that mean for them? Well, they'd have this much more revenue. What could they do with that revenue? How would that show up? So essentially, in this process, the, the major account salesperson, the professional, is simply asking questions and getting the prospective client to describe their situation, to basically go through a process of uncovering. And if there's enough value there, they will sell themselves on the solution. There's no need for the salesperson to push from the outside. By the end of a good meeting like that, or a series of meetings like that, the organization will be asking urgently for the new solution. So get the distinction here and get how important that is. And if you could imagine any sales experience that you went into, if you could experience there was zero push from the outside and simply inquiry and openness and opportunity for you to explore for yourself the potential value and the solution. And that you could also feel that you know, it was OK either way. You know, there was no agenda or specific outcome you had to get to here. What a different experience that would be.
So the three levels of healthcare, the reason I want to include this is so that you realize that when a prospective client comes to you, they may be bringing just a little piece of the picture. And typically where, you know, where the average client is going to come in is going to come in at the survival level, which is basically make this problem go away. Our current medical model is built in entirely around the survival system. You have a disease, you have a symptom, and you want it to make you know, you want to make the problem go away. So the invitation is to hand you know your power over to the doctor, so the doctor can take you under his or her care, and make the problem go away. Now the next level that kind of emerges from this is is there can be some discussion of, you know, here's how to prevent this problem in the future. That is very, very frequently left out of the current Western medical model. But, you know, at its best, it may include some prevention. You know, to prevent this in the future, and this would, you know, here's some examples where this comes into play, say after a heart attack. After a heart attack, the patient maybe could get counseled and say, well, you need to do this exercise. You need to adjust your diet in this way. You need to reduce stress in your life in these ways so that you do not have another heart attack. So there may be some focus on prevention. And that's certainly going to be part of, of what we do with uh, clients. But the third level of healthcare is about thriving. This means expand my health and consciousness. This is ultimately our definition of health in Ayurveda and what makes our system of healthcare so unique. When we start with an understanding that the primordial cause of disease is forgetting our true nature as spirit, and when we start with a description of the definition of health being swasta, being established in the self, being enlightened then we have a radically different approach to healthcare and one that we are very much in need of. Because survival and prevention are both what uh, one of my teachers and mentors, Bill Lamond, Bill Lamond, would call below the line. They both exist in a world of problems. And those both exist in a world that's constructed entirely by the mind. And the core seed of all disease, individually as well as collectively, damage to other people, destruction of the planet, is identification with thought and experience as self, rather than identification with self as self. So ultimately, if somebody comes in, you know, for a digestive issue, when we take them through this process of enrollment, we can illuminate that the digestive issue fits into a much uh, larger, deeper picture and that the way that we really support people is to address the ultimate roots and seeds of health and disease. So I encourage you, because your heart was attracted and because your work is about doing this Ayurveda, the science of life, to really practice it and to embrace that fully, to own that, to claim your space as a practitioner and leader and a very much needed and important evolution in healthcare. It's, there's never been a time that humans haven't needed this. But there's a certain urgency in, uh, in the world now at this point in time. We're about to cross over a tier where our current systems are reaching their maximum. Economic systems, political systems, environmental systems, are sort of simultaneously at a tipping point. And if these core seeds are left in the dark and not addressed, massive amounts of suffering that could be avoided will not be. So we have an important role to play. And I hope you'll let that sit and be in you, not so much as a personal thing, but simply as a movement of consciousness, a wave that's emerging on all of us, and simply to allow it to happen, to allow it to be, not to resist it not to become small to fit by an old cultural picture or worldview. Step on in.
So when we look at an effective structure for your program, we understand that our work is to help people thrive, to become established in the self. We realize that that's our own work. Then we can begin to ask the question, well, what's the most effective structure to help that happen? And what I've found is that the best results come from a committed period of time and a consistent frequency of visits. So I like a commitment of a minimum of three months and then up to 12 months, or you could even go longer. I haven't really seen people necessarily go longer, but there'd be no reason not to. In fact, I'd love to see um, some courageous ones in the group test that, give that a try. But essentially set the stage for a commitment of three to 12 months at a time with a regularly, uh, regular weekly visits. Now you may take a vacation some week, your client might take a vacation, someone might get sick. You might miss a week from here, uh, here and then. But if you have that as a consistent anchor, what you're essentially creating is a culture and a system, a program, a committed program of care that people are investing in, you know, that clients are investing in and coming back to over and over and over again as an environment that moves them towards the results and the reality they want to create. So I encourage a shift from selling Ayurveda as a commodity on a session-by-session session basis to investing in the mode of a complete program of care that supports new consciousness and new behavior for long-term sustainable results. So somebody could invest in pieces and maybe get an insight here or there and maybe have some change. But if you check in with that person five years down the road, how many of them will still be doing that new behavior and maintaining those results? If their culture, if their society, if their system hasn't shifted alongside that, if it hasn't really been anchored, you know, has that smaller financial investment that they made really turned out being uh, better for them? And I think you'll find out that the answer is usually not, that if you can have a uh, have a structure that supports regular time to come back again and again, just like you would with a spiritual teacher or if you've had the experience of you know, going on a retreat. The retreat is amazing. You go there, you have this temporary shift in a, a state of consciousness. But it doesn't necessarily get anchored as a new stage of consciousness unless it's given consistent regular practice and reinforcement. And especially in the beginning, it, it may be very difficult for you to do that by yourself. If you have a sangha, a spiritual community, that you can come back to a space that you can step into on a regular basis. If you have a mastermind group, something that's holding a regular weekly space to come back to again and again, then your likelihood of actually implementing that behavior and getting long-term sustainable results goes way, way up. And this leads us to the third point, that building group programs strengthens commitment and collective alignment. This again we'll get into in step five, but basically be holding the picture, and this becomes again very, very, this is one of the other benefits of having a clear niche, a clear target market, is that there's something that ties your clients together, a way that they can understand each other, a way that they can relate and resonate with each other, ultimately a way that they can grow and change together. So your role is to not only work with people one-on-one, -on -one, but actually to ultimately um, shift culture, shift society, so that there's a change that happens that's bigger than you and that has a life of its own and is not dependent or leveraged simply on you and your activity. So the sales sadhana preparation, again sadhana, spiritual practice, the spiritual practice of this enrollment, of this sales process. You can do with this with me right now to get the feel for it, actually do this. Before you enter into one of these conversations with a prospective client, open your body, which means for one to come into the body. Step into the watcher, the witness. Watch any thoughts that are happening. 
but create space from them. If you start having thoughts about your thoughts, realize that that is the mind again coming in through the back door, egoic thinking. It keeps you contracted to a false sense of self. So remember that you know, the seat of the soul is the anahat chakra, the chitta, the entire field of consciousness. That is who we really are. Come into that space and you'll notice that the body automatically opens. You can become aware of any muscular tension, any tension in the breath. Relax. Ground. Open up your root. Feel the energy of the earth and your connection to the ground. That endless container there that can hold infinite amounts of energy. Just like an electrical circuit needs to ground so that it doesn't uh, explode a light bulb, you need to ground as well if you're going to hold a lot of energy. So feel that connection to the earth. And let that giant space of energy, presence, intense awareness, have a giant container to exist within. When you do this, you create a field of presence that is in itself transformative. If you were to say nothing but simply abide deeply in that presence, all those who enter into it would be affected. You know, they say that the, the Buddha, for example, had this two-mile radius aura. Can you imagine such a space of deep presence that everyone who entered into a general vicinity of it would be affected? So continue to create that and enter into that space consciously before you have one of these conversations. It really is one of the most important pieces. So I don't want to underemphasize it. It's magical what can happen in that space as you just allow things to unfold from there. Be authentically curious. Ask more questions than give information. Again, open a space for inquiry in the individual. And that happens by asking questions, especially open-ended questions that start with what, or how, or where. So what would that be like for you? How would that show up for you? Where would that make the biggest difference in your life? Those sort of questions. Questions direct an individual inward. Information brings somebody out. Really hear the individual. Hear not just their words, but feel the consciousness underneath the words. You'll do that automatically if you're in that space, that field of presence. And again, as you do this, this will allow the motivation to come from inside the prospective client instead of outside from you. And finally, um, anchor this as a core piece, that you want this work for the other person far more than you want this client for your business. Again, this is something that will happen automatically from a place of presence. But it can also help draw you into a place of presence. You can check in and check on your presence by asking, right now am I more focused on getting this client? Or am I more just established in the powerful space of being and inviting this individual into that space? Do I want this work more for the other person then I want them basically as an object or resource or input for my business. So the sales sadhana process itself, we can essentially divide into two parts. Part one is really the uncovering, the intake from the prospective client. We're going to ask about Again, their situation, the problem, what's currently going on with their health. Then we're going to uh, ask about their vision, about what they would like to create, where they would like things to be, what they would like to manifest in their health, the impact that would have on them in their lives. Again, think of the impact as the, uh, the N in spin, the need payoff. Then we're going to ask about any challenges that get in the way of getting there that they can see especially when to uncover any hidden challenges from the inside, ways that these um, that they generate sort of their own internal sabotage around getting these results. And we want to find out the costs that those challenges have on their lives, on their relationships, on their work in the world. 
So when you hear cost, again, think implication questions, that part of the spin model. And then we want to bring that full picture together, that full awakened awareness in with what we can say the deep impact. If they were to overcome these challenges, if they were to flow freely towards their goals, what would that mean? What would that do? Can they experience that space right now? Because that's always where it exists, is right now, ultimately. That's the only thing that's really ever real for the self. There is no past or future. There is only essentially always the now. Part two is uh, a transition into your program, the potential path that you can take this prospective client on should they choose to want to go forward and get support actually overcoming these challenges, actually implementing these behaviors to get these results. So with part two, you're going to ask them if they would like to hear about your program of care. You're going to explain how you support clients. You're going to talk about the structure that you use to get there. You're going to share your guarantee and then share the investment to get started. Then essentially ask them if they would like to get started. We'll talk about what to do if they say yes. You know, just the logistics of that. And then we'll talk about um, how to support them to overcome any obstacles that would get in the way of them moving forward. Not everybody is going to become your client. But those who are meant to will. And this will help you speak directly to those people in a way that helps them connect and see um, how an internal sabotage can actually get in the way of them moving forward. And if you can help them overcome you know, that challenge here to start with, it will also, again, build even further depth and trust and understanding about how you can help them overcome many other things in their life as well. So let's look at each of these. First step one Again, you want to find out about the current situation, the quote unquote, the problem. So you start by setting the intention, you know, sharing the process, and learning about the current state of health. You can say something like, in this process, I'd like to help you clarify your vision and goals for your health, uncover any obstacles that get in your way, and the impact that those have on you. And then we can explore how I can support you if that feels like a fit. And you can check in and say, does that sound good? Is that what you have, uh, have in mind that we're here to do? Make sure that they're on board. So again, just ask questions. Get their, get their buy-in each, each step along the way. Again, you don't want to be just spouting information. And you want to consistently be having the motivation to move forward come from, come from them. So the first question to ask here is uh, about what's currently going on. So you can say, tell me a little bit about what's going on with your overall health. And when I say overall health, I mean physically, emotionally, even spiritually. And we don't want this to take you know, 15, 20 minutes or anything. We want this to be a few minutes. So that's why we say, tell me a little bit about your health. You could even say, you know, give me the snapshot about what's going on with your overall health. You know, the biggest things for you physically emotionally, spiritually. We don't have to get into elaborate stories or descriptions. We just want to have a, a current sense of things. If they end up going uh, longer than you want and it's disconnected, you can just let them know that you understand, that you hear that, you can reflect it back, and you can ask if there's a particular part that might be missing. Uh, if you want to hear more about emotionally, if you want to clarify what you mean by spiritually, you can check in on that. I will, I'll, I'll clarify this last piece is that step one is different. This is different than your initial intake for a new client. That will happen after they've decided that they'd like to move forward with a pro program of committed care. You'll have a chance to do the full deep dive into 
everything that's happening for them to, you know, you'll have a chance to get the full and complete picture. But this isn't the time. This is the time to get a little bit of it, the snapshot, the overall feel. Step two is the vision. It's helping them build the vision for what they would like to create. And the reason this is so powerful is that this, if you, again, connect into, uh, we exist right now in a physical world that is held like um, a small basket with an infinitely larger luminous astral sphere, and ultimately that within the infinite realm of the causal universe. So everything that exists physically is supported by an energetic template subtly. And that world is much more fluid, much more malleable. So when you ask somebody about their vision and really help them to feel it and to get the details of it, they are in that moment creating an energetic template to grow into. It actually exists at a subtle level. It's there now waiting for them to fill in with physical actions to let that unfold. That's ultimately what allows things to come from the astral or the subtle world into the physical world, simply action, alignment of behavior with that new energy. So the question to ask is, where would you like to be with your overall health in the next six months? So this is a way for you to already set up the time frame that you work with clients for. So if it's three months, three months, six months, six months, if it's 12 months, you know, in the next year. Check in with them physically. What are some of the experiences that would be really great for them, what, you know, that they would like, they met, that is sort of, again, um, realistic but not limited. Realistic but not limited. Where would they like to be physically, emotionally, spiritually? Have them clarify as much as the, of that as they can. The more that they clarify, the more that they build this, the more that they will be ready to actually take steps forward to creating it. So make sure it's there, it's connected, that it's real for them. And then step three, of course, is to carry that deeper by getting the impact, the need payoff. Experience the impact this vision would have on their life. You can ask, what would these results do for you? How would that feel? How would they impact your life? How would they impact your relationships? How would they impact your work? Get a sense for you know, how this, this is just data at this point, to be in that place physically, emotionally, spiritually. You know, what would that look like? Deep in the picture here. Take it further. You will know that you are there when you feel it viscerally. And again, if you're in this space of presence, whatever's going on in the other individual will be very alive, very easy for you to read and feel in your own body. If you don't have the filter of your mind getting in the way, you'll be highly sensitive to everything that's going on for them. They will also feel that incredible space of potential and presence that they are in with you. And it's very common that even by this third question, they may have tears, they may have deep wells of emotion that come up as they settle into this energetic reality and how much that means to them. Step four, the challenges. Find out what stands in the way of getting these results. And ask multiple times to uncover the hidden challenges. And so you can ask this question Again, multiple times to see what else might be there. What are the challenges that you see could slow you down, stand in your way, or stop you from getting these results? So you go kind of soft, soft, hard, right? Slow you down, stand in your way, or stop you from getting these results. So you want to see what's there. And also just take note of any place where they give their power away, where they make the challenge something outside of themselves, a condition that they tell themselves they have no ability to impact or to change. Usually these are aspects of the collective, the culture that they're a part of, the systems that they're a part of. And 
you know, if it feels uh, appropriate, you can ask about that. You can ask about how long, for example, they've been a part of a culture or relationship. Is that familiar to them? Have they noticed that they've tended to generate these sort of systems over and over again, these sort of agreements? And doing that is basically a subtle way of bringing their attention back into their power, right? their sanshaya, the way that they actually generate and play a role in creating their reality and the agreements in their lives. Again, if, there's, if, if it's something that is basically outside of them, they're not going to feel, you know, that's kind of a safe space for it to live. As long as the problem's outside of me, then there's nothing I can do about it, so I'm all good, right? So that's part of what Thomas does, is Thomas takes the power out of an individual and puts it into circumstances or others. Step five are exploring the costs, again, the implications here. So uncover and illuminate the full cost of these challenges. This is so huge. How long have these challenges been present? Right? If somebody in this moment can realize that this particular challenge that's gotten in the way of them getting this result is something that has been with them for, say, 40 years, well, simply bringing that to light provides a heck of a lot of motivation to change it. Wow, I've been doing this for 40 years. Now that I just bring that into my awareness, again, bring it from Thomas into Rajas, there's energy there now. That's sort of the hallmark of Rajas. It brings in energy, it brings in desire to move, to change. How have they impacted your life? Do you know how have these things shown up for you? over and over again. So you can do past, you can do present, you know, what are they doing in your life right now? What have they done in the past? And then you can also go future. How do you think they could impact you in the future if they're not resolved, if they're not changed, if they're not addressed? If you continue basically on this same default path, do you like what you see? You get how powerful that is to again really bring to light the full impact of the choices that we make. Again, our results, as we look through the lens of interval Ayurveda, are made up of the behaviors that we take on a regular, consistent basis over and over and over again, and the inner world culture and systems that support those behaviors. So this is where we go to step six, again, the deep impact. Kind of think heaven and earth. If you feel the energy of this process, you can feel that when you check in about the vision, the impact of the vision, the energy goes up. You know, there's, there's this movement of upward energy. When you ask about the challenges, when you really become honest about the cost and the impact, the energy is much more grounding, real, settling. Right? We even say the energy can be grave. Right? You think of grave, well, that's down in the ground. It's low. So you go up. You go down, and then this is a way to basically bring those worlds together. Now that the vision has been built, the challenges have been uncovered, bring them together to experience the impact at a deeper level. It's a simple question. They may have very similar answers to the first time, but it will be with another layer of depth. If you could overcome these challenges and flow freely towards your goals, what would that do for you? What would be the best part? of all of this, what's sort of the essence. Get down to the core of what this means. There might be a lot of you know great benefits, but what's at the heart of all of this? What do you what is your what is your basically your soul calling out for here? So that's the first part, you know, the steps one through six, uncovering, revealing, connecting. Step seven, you have a, a transition into uh, discussing your program, how you work with people. And again, you, know, you do it as an offering. You let you see if they would like to move forward with it. I will say that I've never had anybody say no to this question. Uh, it's possible. 
But now you can transition into the presentation of your program. And you can ask, I have a program that is specifically dev designed to help you, or you could say, you know, to help whatever your prospective client market is, to help you overcome these sorts of challenges and to achieve these sorts of results with your health or in your life or in your experience. Would you like to hear a little bit about it? So again, it makes it as a question. And usually at this point, this is absolutely they want to hear about it. But again, you can say it as a little bit. So you're going to give little, little pieces, little nuggets. This is not your whole comprehensive philosophy, just as you asked for a little bit about their current health situation. You're going to share a little bit, an overview, what they need to know about how you work with your clients. So you'll say, great and describe the areas where you support your clients. <clears throat> and as you describe the areas where you support your clients, bring in examples from what they've shared. So these are the four areas, again, from the integral Ayurveda platform where you can say you support people. Um, you know, basically everything that you're going to do is going to fall into these four areas. So you can language them however you like, um, but essentially you know, this covers all the ground, all the territory. The first is, helping people clarify their goals and their vision. Right? You need to know where you're headed to be able to get there. If you don't know where you're going, it's very hard to get there. So you'll say, you know, clarify your goals and your vision. You can say a lot of what we've been doing right now, finding out what's important to you, what have been the challenges that, that get in the way of you getting there, um, really uncovering what, what, what drives both the, both the challenges as well as what drives the results that you want to get. And after each of these, check in and see if they have any any questions about that particular area and check in and ask if that would if they feel like that would be valuable for them. So you could say, you know, the first area where I help my clients is really clarifying your goals and your vision so that you know where you're headed. If you don't know where you're headed, if you don't know what you want, it's really hard to create that. Do you have any questions about that? No, that's great. And do you feel like that would be valuable for you? Yeah, that's very important, of course. So then go through the other areas. The other area where you're going to be able to support people, of course, is adjusting behaviors, helping them see. And this is, again, this is where your behavioral theory of change comes in. It's sort of the cornerstone of your practice. Being able to help people you know, really clearly connect the dots and build a case for the behaviors that they're doing right now that are creating their challenges why and how, as well as the new behaviors that are going to help them get their results. So you're going to help make those crystal clear for them. You're going to pick the biggest leverage areas, and you're going to help them uh, move forward and see why that's important. So adjusting behaviors. The next is aligning consciousness, their own individual consciousness. So you can again share that you know, when we try to actually change behaviors or change results in our lives, we often come up against internal obstacles in our own being. They can be limiting thoughts, beliefs, feelings, patterns of energy, places where we just get stuck from the inside. So one thing that we're going to be doing in our work is helping you to resolve any of those stuck areas so that your inner world is very much aligned with the outer behaviors and outer results that you want to create essentially that you can live as the person that has those results. And then the fourth area where you can help your clients is aligning the collective space. That means talking about, you know, again, their culture, which is their relationships, the groups that they're a part of, their sort of shared mindsets and worldviews. Make sure that those are lined up to support them, adjusting anything there. It's going to get in the way, create a... Um, a current that they have to fight against, that they have to sort of willpower through. Anything like that is going to be unsustainable long term. Same thing with the systems that they're a part of, their schedule, the different ways that their life is set up, their environment, their shared behaviors. These are all the ways that we support people to get long term sustainable results. As Yogananda said, environment is stronger than willpower. So if you go into a space that is automatically supportive for you, it, 
takes much less personal effort. They're carried there naturally. So as much as you can help to construct that system, that culture for your clients through group work, through systems, through schedules, through ways that you, you know, build structure and then help them take inventory of their own life and modify agreements, modify their space, modify their culture so that it's set up to align them, things will become not, again, just easier, but ultimately inevitable. At the end of that, just check in, say, do you have any questions about those four areas? Do those all make sense? Do those all feel valuable for you? And they may ask, again, next about step eight. It's, it often comes out of them naturally they want, that they want to say, like, okay, so tell me a little bit more about just what this looks like. If they don't ask that, if they don't, you know, if they say, I don't have any other questions, then you can, you can just ask them. Say, well, the next thing that um, you know, people often like to hear about is the actual structure of this program. You know, what, is this, what does this look like working together? And you can ask if they'd like to hear about that. So would you like to hear about the structure of the program? And then, you know, to say yes, which again, I've, I've really not ever had anybody not say yes to that. Let them know about the structure. You can say, I work with my clients for, say, six months at a time. We see each other on a weekly basis. And, uh, you know, if you need another call throughout the week, that's fine. You just want to very much create that space of abundance. Step out of the payment procession model and again, consciously step into a structure, a program of support model. They are no longer now paying you on an hourly basis. They are not paying you on a session per session basis. They are investing in a program of care. They are investing in an environment that's going to help them get the results and the consciousness that they want. It has nothing to do, really, with time or sessions or meetings. But there's a general structure, right? We want to connect on a weekly basis want to be able to let you reach out whenever you need to if there's something else. You know, I, I, I keep my email channels wide open so that people can reach out whenever they have a question, anything. Uh, I want you to feel like you have a blanket of support, like you have everything you need to overcome these challenges and achieve these results with your health, that there's no place where they feel like there's some big gap. And again, you can set up the structure. You can say, you know, you might take a vacation. I might take a vacation. One of us might get sick. You know, we just we might have something that pulls us out in a particular week. And that week, we can either reschedule or we can just pick it up the next week. Essentially, know that what you're stepping into is a, a program of care here, an environment of consistent support that I found is the most um, effective way for helping people get long-term sustainable results. So then ask, ask about that. Do you have any questions about the structure of the program? You know, ask how that sounds to them. That, how does that sound to you? People really like that. Um, the exact opposite, often people have the illusion or the limiting belief that providing such a committed structure that there's going to be resistance to doing that. And usually it's the exact opposite. Somebody feels like, wow, you are confident enough to actually provide something that I know that I need to really get long-term sustainable results. So it provides actually much more confidence, um, assurance. People feel very held within this structure. And then step nine is your guarantee. So again, any other questions you have, and they again, they may ask uh, just by themselves. If they don't ask, then you can let them know. You can say, well, uh, you know, last thing that people usually want to know about is the actual investment in getting started with this program. Would you like to hear about that? And they, they will usually be interested in that. So before you actually share your rates, the investment, I recommend that you share a guarantee. Here's the purpose of the guarantee. Basically. Ask if they'd like to hear about the investment in the program, and then before sharing your rates, share your guarantee. Because the guarantee removes a lot of the, the perceived risk in getting started. It also communicates a lot of confidence to offer a guarantee, you know, that you're basically fine with somebody walking away, you're fine with returning money if it's not a fit. You know, the essence of a guarantee is that you believe in what you're offering. 
And so for that reason, it also very much reinforces your sadhana, specifically reinforces that space of deep presence, of no fear. Again, fear comes from mind and fear and presence. You can't be in mind. Mind is the only place that you can actually even have a concept of fear. Otherwise, you just experience things as flows of, of energy and folding of awareness. And it makes it so that you, again, you want this work very much more for them than you're looking for them as a client. So especially great to anchor this because as soon as you get into the investment, a big flow of energy comes up with that. It's a big reshift of prana and awareness. So you want to make sure that you've got a nice, solid, open container ready to handle that flow. It's going to be there. It's going to be there in you. It's going to be there in them. So you can say, um, you know, some some variety of this. If you like my wording, you know, use it exactly. If you want to modify it at all, do what you need to with it. But get the essence of it. And uh, the way I say it basically is, it, my program comes with my happiness guarantee. If in our first 30 days working together, you don't absolutely love the work that we're doing, if you don't feel that's exactly what you need to help you overcome these challenges to achieve these results with your health then not only are you not obliged to continue the program to continue in coaching or consulting, but also refund every penny you've paid so far. How does that sound? Boom. That's very settling. It's very grounding. It's there. It's full. Now you can step into it. The final step, step 10, the investment. Share the investment in the program and essentially just ask which feels like the best fit, which is a great way to just move forward if, if they're ready. And if they're not, then we can go into how you can support them and what gets in the way. So you can offer a monthly rate and a full pay. Um, I recommend that you keep your, your structure very consistent and not sort of have a whole bunch of fudge room there. Um, the more that you play around with the actual structure of your program, the more that I find it actually creates subconsciously um, a, a sense that, that, that the foundation is weakened, that there's not as strong a container to hold the process. So I don't like to give really options in the structure of the program, but I do like to give options in the investment in the program. Uh, so you can offer, you know, the most typical way to do it is to offer a monthly rate and then a full pay rate with, um, you know, that gives basically a special rate that offers a savings. So you would say, well, there are two options for investing in the program. You can do a full pay for the six months, or you can pay on a monthly basis. All right? So if you pay on a monthly basis, then the rate is X dollars. And if you do the full pay, then the rate is Y dollars. So you know, for six months, you may basically take um, one, month, uh, one month fee off. They might get, you know, the six months might be included if they do a full pay. If this is something you want to move forward with, which of those feels like the best fit for you? Right? So if this is something you want to move forward with, which of those feels like the best fit for you? You're just asking it there, and if they're ready to move forward, and you'll you'll be surprised. You'll actually, this will surprise you the first few times that this happens. How many people will just let you know? We'll just say, well, the monthly sounds better, or the full pay sounds better. And you say, great. And go ahead and sign them up right there. Um, the reason the full pay is so great is that you know cash in hand now is much better than potential cash in hand later. So I recommend you know that you give a full pay rate. Also, they only need to think about the money, the investment once, and then they're set. And they're, the program is good there on a monthly basis. Uh, even though they're committed to a program, and you know, the assumption is that you're going to keep on going on each month, um, it still kind of comes up each time they have to pull out their, their wallet and write a check or do a, their credit card. It, it sort of it comes up there again, which is fine. Um, but you know, it's, it's one other potential obstacle or hurdle that if it can be addressed all at once, it's great. And you can just focus all on the work from there going forward.
So logistics. Um, once they say, yes, I'd like to move forward, then you'll want to schedule their first official session. You'll find a time that works on a weekly basis, consistent time there. And then uh, I recommend just creating it as a, re as a recurring weekly appointment. And if your calendar system allows for it, then you can just send the event to your new client's email. And it will automatically get plugged in in their calendar as a weekly recurring appointment as well. Then you can collect their information to enter into your database system. And uh, you can see the business resources section for some ideas about uh, how to manage your database. You know, if it's, if it's just even a paper or a file system for now, that's totally fine. Um, ultimately, you'll probably find that it's really great to be able to integrate all of your information electronically. And um, I have a platform that I use for that that I'll share with you that I really, really like. It pulls everything together. Um, and I'm planning on uh, you know, really deepening how we use that and then sharing, uh, sharing that with our community. Uh, then give them your new client paperwork to complete uh, before their first official session. And as far as new client paperwork goes, I, I went ahead and updated my client paperwork. I just made a few changes I got to look it over again. And I'll include that for you this week. I'll include it as a, a Word document with this webinar so that you can have that uh, just as a template if, if, you're, if you've struggled at all with your client paperwork. Uh, you can use that, adjust it, you know, use it exactly, to do whatever you want. You can just you know, plug your logo into the header or your information and, and use it as is or change what you like. Uh, you'll want to include that as, long, as well as with your informed consent template that we covered um, in week four with the legalities of practice. And then collect their payment. All right, so this is where the, you know, that really that rush of, of prana into this new investment, this new priority of their life is coming. Uh, I recommend being able to accept check, cash, though very few people pay large amounts of money in, in cash. Uh, the most common way for people to pay it is with a credit card. So you'll want to be able to accept credit cards. And I, um, I have a merchant account that I, I really uh, like a lot and that I recommend to you. It's very easy to set up any form that you like that you can do either online or you can actually have a credit card machine and run that. Uh, this particular merchant is you know, very much aligned with our values in the Ayurvedic community. There's a 10% donation. So um, again, they're just in the business resources. And uh, you can look into them or whatever is a fit, basically some way to be able to collect a credit card. You know, there's some cost in being able to accept credit cards, but the important thing to realize is that there is much more cost and not being able to accept credit cards. All it takes is one single client who doesn't move forward with you because that option's not available uh, to have entirely covered you know, a year of potentially credit card costs for you. So what are some of the reasons that clients do, don't move forward? Well, here are, the, here are kind of the big, the big three uh, that people will say. One is, of course, the money. I can't afford it. I can't afford it. The second is I need to think about it, right, which is just a way to go up into the mind. And, you know, it's not that that's invalid and that there's no reason, you know, not to think about it. But uh, thoughts are, again, not usually where we get our best information. We get our best information from awareness, from presence. Um, which is sometimes a little bit difficult to understand if somebody is constantly identified with the mind. They think that that's where clarity comes from. But all the mind can do is really spit out consistent rationaliz rationalizations and logical arguments that line up with, it, with whatever your current patterns of energy are, your current identity. It's not going to give you really new stuff um, unless it's reflecting a state of presence and then presence can generate as a new thought or a new belief. And the third is I need to talk to my someone, my husband, my wife, my whoever, right? And um, this, again, is a way just to say that this choice isn't really about me. You know, somebody else is involved in this choice. And I don't want to, again, there's no validity to this, but I also want to point out that this can be one very easy way for people to uh, is put off or resist change by handing it over to someone else. 
I talked it over with my husband or I talked it over my, with my wife and you know, they agreed. They said we just can't afford it right now. All right, so all these different ways, but again, when we ultimately get down to um, uncovering the cost of what this has meant, uh, that argument doesn't have a lot of weight, even logically or rationally. It's typically just a pattern. So these are the two things that underlie all three of these reasonings. The biggest one is that most of this is resistance to change. There is um, individual resistance as well as collective or cultural resistance. Right, we exist in a culture where it's just fine to spend thousands of dollars on a vacation or a flat screen TV, but when it, when it comes in investing in um, actual growth and your health and your consciousness, we don't have the same sort of cultural uh, go-ahead on that. Right? The, the ongoing cultural default message that's uncommon. That's not the norm. So you've got that collective resistance, but you also have the individual resistance, which again is just ego ahamkara, anything that is different than the current familiar, than the status quo, even if it's a brighter, more brilliant, more wonderful future that you're stepping into. There can be fear, contraction, resistance that happens in the mind and the, ego, and the ahamkara's identification with the mind. And, you know, the other thing to, to really um, be aware of is that this can also very much be a reflection that the enrollment process just didn't connect deeply enough. And um, if the presence hasn't been there, if, if the questions have really kind of missed on really touching truth for the person, then the full value oftentimes hasn't been uncovered and it may not be enough to, to move forward with. So those are two things to be aware of, about the underlying reasons behind those three things. So here's how to support people. Um, and this is a great opportunity to do the first bit of work. You can basically say, you know, I, I want to support you to be able to make a decision from a place of peace. And it sounds like you know, there are kind of two things happening for you right now. One is that there's part of you that's really clear about you know the cost that these things have had on your on your health on your life these challenges what it would mean to you to be able to have this support to move forward to actually get these results in your life and there's maybe another part of you that begins to contract maybe has some fear has some resistance um, and that's showing up as you know around the money or wherever it is so you just check in you know, is that does that feel accurate for you that those two things are, are there you know, just again step into awareness to the witness so we can see both of them. And then say, well, you know, if, if you're open to it, I'd love to be able to support you to make uh, the decision from a place of peace. Um, you know, I want this work for you far more than I want you as just another client for my business. And, you know, if this is right for you, then I'd love to support you to move forward. And if it's not the right fit, whatever, then, you know, that's fine as well. Um, but let's go ahead and, and make it make sure that you can be clear. So would you like support in just getting to that place? And yeah, usually people will be up for it if you have time. And not everyone will be able to come through to the other side, but many people will. So you want to be able to address the underlying energy pattern through bringing awareness to the feeling in the body. That's the first place that we go. We need to come out of the mind, out of the thoughts, out of the rationalizations, all the mind can ever do is interpret feelings in a contracted sort of symbolic sort of way. The mind is a constant filter that gets in the way of us actually ever truly knowing anything. So right now, just as you look around you, if you're in the mind, your mind's constantly identifying, naming, judging. When you are in the self as pure awareness, as presence, you actually get to experience everything, the true nature of it. And in that, you feel deep peace deep well of joy, consciousness. So you can have them bring their attention just to where they feel the feeling the most in their body so they can bring their energy back into the body. Give it all their awareness, all their attention. Um, you can say, you know, if we had a crying baby, we wouldn't want to just stick that baby in the closet and run downstairs and turn on the TV and not pay attention to it. We want to hold the baby. We want to be with it 
hear what its needs are, just really let it uh, feel heard. So go to that feeling in your body. You can even go to the center of it. Let it be as intense as it needs to be. Bring your full awareness with it. Don't judge it. Don't name it. Just breathe into it and allow it to be. And as you're with that, let me know if it shifts or changes or moves around in any way. And if somebody can do this, and again, if you support this through being in a place of deep presence with them, they'll be able to come to a place of peace. If the feeling can be felt, it will be resolved. It will be transmuted into peace and even into joy. So you can ask them again, now, how do you feel? And from that place, check in with them again. And from then, you can be really clear. So from this space, when you think about moving forward with this program, how do you feel? And you want to do it. What I recommend also is to basically um, you know, to bring people up to your rate before going down. Meaning you can be flexible and you can maintain you know, a scholarship fund when there's where there's a real financial need. Because in many cases, you know, it, it may be it may be true. Um, the other thing is though, of course, as people do this work, their financial changes, their financial realities can often change as well. So you kind of can leave space for both of those realities, where knowing that if you can bring somebody up to your rate, that's actually going to be far better for them in terms of their commitment, their sense of their value in it. Um, but there will be other times where you know keeping a scholarship fund is great as well, and you can ask the person, well, if that doesn't feel you know like a fit, I'd still very much like to work with you. Do you, and, you know, it sounds like you're really clear that you want this, and you want to be sure that that is truly where they're coming from. Where they say, you know. I'm so clear that I want this, and I even am in this place of peace, but I just literally, I cannot, like there's no place that I can imagine being able to pull these resources from. So, you know, if, if, you're, if you've got space for more clients and you'd like to take them on anyway, then you can, keep, you can keep space for that. And you can say, well, what is an amount that feels like it would be really uh, workable, doable for you? And again, just ask them to touch into that, that place of awareness of stillness for that, not to, not to look for an answer in the mind, but to let it surface truly from that place. And ultimately, that is, that's very powerful as well. The third thing that you can do, and this is something I did um, when I was uh, you know, building both my Ayurvedic practice as well as my business coaching and consulting practice with Everyday Ayurveda back in um, September. 2010, was to offer a special introductory session rate for people who are ready to get started right away. So that's a way that you can um, create a bit more uh, of a direct channel to move forward, right? that you can sort of overcome the mind's hurdle. Because then the mind will think like, well, gosh, I don't want to miss out on this opportunity. So that can be there as well. You can say, so normally my rates are this much if you pay on a monthly basis or this much for the full pay. But uh, you know, for my clients, that decides that they you can have as long as you want to think about that. But if you're really clear that you want to move forward now, I also have special introductory session rates, and you know that's then X amount on the monthly basis or Y for the special rate, and then it's even uh, you know reduced rates from from your normal rates there. So that's another thing that you can you can do, and, um, and that works quite well. What I do recommend for that though is that you basically start at a rate that works really well for you and come down to it. Don't start at a low rate and go lower. Suzuki Roshi uh, once said this when responding to a Zen meditation student who was concerned about how making money would affect his spiritual practice. He said, yes, to be attached to wealth is a terrible thing. To be attached to poverty is also a terrible thing. Good. Now that you understand, it's better to be rich. Do you get this? Do you understand this, right? Is that, yes, being, being attached to wealth is as much of an egoic trap as anything. But being attached to poverty or a state of lack or challenge around money, like having issues with your financial health, is just as much a challenge. And ultimately, Money is a tool. It's just a, it's a resource. It's part of a system. 
And so if you have more of it, then you can do more things. If you have less of it, then you can do fewer things. And this is the last section that I want to cover with you are some empowering money and value beliefs. I'd love for you to just work with, let them work on your mind, work on your heart, work on your consciousness. So if there's any place internally that's a snag that will get in the way of you feeling just absolutely great about accepting money for your work, uh, these can help to clear these. So uh, the first is that I want Ayurvedic practitioners to make as much money as possible. The reason I want that is it's so that more wealth and power are aligned with consciousness, right? Can you imagine a world where Ayurvedic practitioners are the billionaires instead of oil and banking CEOs? Would that be different? How would that massive amount of wealth and power coming through those channels of holistic consciousness and awareness, those hearts and minds, what different collective space might that create? I personally trust it. I like it better. I think it would serve more people. The second is that my clients deserve to invest in their work with me. How about flipping that around, right? Not, not only do you deserve to make a great income doing this work, which you do, and you, uh, you know, think of your work as actually far more valuable than what an attorney might offer, what a CPA might offer, what a medical doctor might offer, in terms of the value that you actually offer people. And think about the rates that those people get paid and bring your rate at least up to that rate. But then take it a further level that your clients deserve to invest in their work with you. Right? They deserve it. So fight for them. Fight for them to get this good stuff, the stuff that's going to make the biggest return on investment in their lives. Uh, the third here is that money carries prana, right? Money carries energy, and it reflects our priorities in life. So when my clients invest in their work with me, they're prioritizing their health. They're putting energy into their health. They're putting energy into their consciousness. And where we put our energy grows. So where they put their energy is health and consciousness. When they invest in their work with me, they get more of those things. That's a good thing. Fourth, my service offers value with a priceless return on investment. It's really very much, it's very hard to put a price on being able to have more energy, more engagement in life, more true joy, more freedom from the suffering of attachment and identification with the mind and the senses, All right, living a life in, in pain, living a life of diminished health. Um, ultimately, we need to have a rate, we need to have a price for our services, but can you really kind of say that there's a price on being able to have these things? And is there any other place where somebody could invest their money that could give them a return like this, that could give them a sort of value. And my belief is that there's really not, that this is an incredibly rare thing and that we should celebrate it and value it for what it is. So we ended up actually definitely going our full uh, 90 minutes here tonight. As I said, next week, um, I will go ahead and look and see what questions we have here to, to wrap up. But next week, we'll take all of this, and we will um, spend our basically our entire time doing group coaching so we can really integrate all of this from the last three weeks, building your program, designing your content, and practicing your enrollment, your sales on the practice. What I'd love for you to do this week to implement, to take action, actually get these results is to do two or more practice sales sadhana sessions and to name your session. So if you've actually already come up with a good name for one of your pieces of content, apply that to your sales sadhana session. So it'd be your free one hour, um, I heard from, from one of you, you know, uh, mastering menopause. So you'd have your free one hour mastering menopause session. 
practice it with at least two people. It can be two people from your mastermind groups or somebody else, a friend or family member in your life. Get feedback and just really settle into it. Do at least two of them. And then start using this process with your new prospective clients. Start enrolling them. Step into this model. Go through this fire here and get these results. And then secondly, bring presence to any thoughts and feelings that arise with this process. You can use the 3 two, one the shadow process with any triggers that you find that you have around money. It may be a trigger around people who have a lot of money. Unpack any of that stuff so that you can integrate it. Just again, do this own process of, of being present. And I included exercises for each of these this week uh, to support you in these practices. Uh, then customize your new client paperwork if you if you don't have that already. If you'd like to use what, what I've put in place, I think it's pretty comprehensive. Uh, then you can cu customize it so that you have that ready for your new clients. So this is the week. This is the week to step into this. Go through it. Post a comment on the blog. Meet with your mastermind group. And then we can come back next week. I want to hear about everything that's been emerging for all of you. Um, the actions you're taking, the results you're getting, and then, of course, uh, any challenges that you're facing so that we can overcome them. Anything that you're facing, you're not alone. You know, know that you're in community here. And anything that you've faced, many other people have faced. And even if people have overcome it, as we address it for you, it will offer additional insights. So come next week ready to share, um, ready to, uh, to do some work again. You can go ahead and look at the questions that we have here, and then we'll go ahead and wrap up. Darn, so Michelle said that the sound had been going in and out. Um, Michelle, the most common reason for that um, is that your computer bandwidth on your side can fluctuate. So if you're listening to the sound through your microphone or through your computer instead of um, instead of through the actual phone line, that, that can be the cause. So see if that addresses it for you. And again, all the sound should be fine on the replay because I've been on a landline here specifically for that reason. Carol, you said, um, thanks, uh, you have to go, but the information has been great. Well, you can catch the, um, catch the replay, of course. And to all of you, I, I send you my love. Um, I am with you in presence. I am with you in swasta. And I really look forward to uh, connecting with you next week. Anirad, I love the baby in the closet analogy. That's great. And I want to give credit, credit where credit is due for that one. That came from uh, Christian Michelson, uh, somebody who coaches coaches and who I've gotten a lot of, a lot of value from. Uh, and I love I loved the way that he said that as well. I, do, I agree. It's a great visual. You know, if you can imagine basically these feelings that are calling out for attention, what we commonly do is just stuff them. Don't look at it. Don't be with it. We've got to rush off. Let the mind sort of carry us into the next thought. Very good. And Christine, do you have any suggestions on where you begin with your fees for what you talked about tonight? That's a great question. Um, what I would say is basically look at what you want your monthly income to be. And again, I'm holding as a minimum goal. This is, this is mine for you. It can be different, but I'd encourage you to at least come to this if you're not there. And if you are there, go beyond it. Stretch yourself. But I would say, you know, I think a, a, at least a sustainable income for an Ayurvedic practitioner would be something around perhaps $5,000 a month. So if you take $5,000 a month and you look at the total number of hours you have per week for your practice, divide those total hours in half so that you can basically give half of your time to working on your business and half of your time to working in your business, then look at those hours that you have. So say you want to work a 30-hour week you would have 15 client hours, then you're probably not always going to have a full practice. You, know, you very well may, but you might say, okay, well, assuming that I at least have 10 clients on a weekly basis, you know, 10, and I have up to 15, if I want to have $500, if I want to have $5,000 per month in monthly income, and I have 10 clients, then each of those 10 clients, basically, um, their monthly rate that they're paying me needs to be around $500. So I would make that you know, your baseline, your, your bottom, and then you could go up from there in terms of either if you get more than 10 clients or if you set your rates a little higher than that, then you're at least hitting your minimum goal for your practice, say $5,000 a month. I will also mention that, that um, 
in marketing, we've learned that some numbers are more psychologically attractive to people than others. Those numbers, and what I mean by that is that they just, for whatever reason, they tend to create less resistance to buying. And so the numbers that people find very attractive are fours and sevens and nines, which is the reason that you'll sometimes you'll see my, um, you know, my pricing as well as many other you know, savvy uh, marketers' pricings often incorporate fours and nines and sevens. So instead of $500, for example, you might say 497 or at least 547 or 597 so um, you know, try try that out. Give those a shot. Uh, you can always test it and see if that's true for you. But I have found that to be consistently true. It's an interesting phenomenon. Um, you know, it's it's such that even if the price is higher, but it includes those attractive numbers, the sales can actually go up. So it, if you said, if for for example, if you had a book and you sold the book for twenty four ninety seven. Uh, that you can potentially actually generate more sales than if you sold that same book for $20 even. So just an interesting phenomenon, something that uh, you know people who study these things have, have found. So um, I don't argue with success. I use it. Why, why create a, any other barrier there or obstacle? Use what works. So that's what I would recommend. Find your ideal monthly rate. Great question, by the way. Ideal monthly, monthly rate. Divide it by the number of client hours you have available, and then go up a little bit from there so that you hit at least your monthly goal, and then you know that you know, at the very uh, least you're hitting your goals, and then if you go beyond that, even better. All right, so again, uh, closing, um, closing here, and looking forward to hearing what uh, all of you bring next week. Thanks for spending the time. Namaste.